Hello Flight Simmers and welcome back to Alpha Hotel Flight Simulator Training. In this video we'll take a look at how to control and change the weather in Microsoft Flight Simulator. There are a lot of different things you can do with the weather in Flight Sim. You can use it to primarily create beautiful flight environments to fly in. You can make changes that will affect your aircraft's performance. You can set up realistic instrument weather for practicing instrument flying or tackling challenging weather scenarios. And you can set completely unrealistic weather for just for the fun of it. There are also a number of different ways to manipulate the weather in Flight Sim, and if you're new to the sim, it can be a little overwhelming. So in this video, we'll take a deep dive into the weather controls in Flight Sim and talk about all the ways you can change it to get the most out of your Flight Sim experience. Before we dive in, I'll mention that the build of the sim being used for this video was the public beta of Sim Update 11, which was game version 1.29.22.0, released on the 12th of October 2022. The weather changes in Sim Update 11 are minimal and mostly focus on making the live weather a little better, so the information in this video should be applicable to how the weather system functions as of Sim Update 10. So first, let's take a look at the option settings that will affect the weather system. So from the main menu, we'll go to options, and then we will go to general options, and you can access this, these menus also from in-flight uh, by pre pressing the escape key. There are a few graphics uh, options that will affect the weather system. Uh, really, the only one that has a material effect is the vol volumetric cloud setting. Uh, if you have this set on a higher setting, this will adjust the quality of the clouds. They'll look a little better, uh, but it will have uh, an effect on your performance. The only other thing in the graphics that's directly weather related is the water waves. And again, the higher you set this, the better that the water and the waves in the water are going to look, and that will be affected by the wind. Um, and but it does have the tendency to have an effect on your performance. Those are really the only two settings in the graphics that are going to affect the weather system. The next thing we'll look at is the data options and the only one that affects weather here is the live weather uh, data connection option and you can toggle this on and off. This does not actually turn live weather on or off. What this does is it enables the live weather data stream. So you do need to have this on to be able to get live weather but to actually toggle the weather on and off you do that from the main weather menu. So this just enables the data stream so that you can get the live weather, but to actually turn it on and off, you do that from the main weather menu, either on the world map or in the in-flight world, uh, in-flight weather uh, options menu. So the next settings uh, we'll take a look at is in the miscellaneous tab, the units of measurement. We have three different settings we can choose from here that will determine what values you set your weather settings in. Uh, the first is straight metric system. The second one is in uh, the hybrid system. And then the final one is the US system. So let's take a look at how those change the way that you set the weather values. So if you have your system set to straight metric, you will have uh, these values set in metric. You'll have precipitation in millimeters an hour. You'll have snow depth set in centimeters. You'll have your temperature set in degrees C or Celsius. Uh, you'll have your uh, pressure, or your uh, altimeter setting set in hectopascals or millibars. And then you will set your cloud height in meters rather than feet. Straight metric is pretty uncommon in aviation. Uh, most, uh, av most countries use uh, a hybrid system that we'll talk about here in just a second that has the altitudes and feet. Uh, the only countries that use straight metric in aviation are China, Mongolia, North Korea, Russia, and Tajikistan. And the last two only use uh, metric altimetry uh, in their lower airspace areas. They don't use it in the high altitude airspace. So it's fairly uncommon to use a straight metric system in the real world. So if you set it to the hybrid system, the only difference is that the clouds are now measured in feet rather than meters. And uh, this hybrid system is probably the ICAO standard uh, International Civil Aviation Organization. Most countries in the world will use this system for reporting uh, weather and setting altimeters. 
uh, and that sort of thing. So this is the most common system in places like Europe, Asia, South America, pretty much everywhere in the world except for the United States and a few other countries. Uh, this is kind of the standard weather system. With the U.S. system, the changes are that the precipitation is set in inches an hour, the snow depth is set in inches, uh, the temperature is set in degrees Fahrenheit, and the pressure is set in uh, inches of mercury. Uh, and then the clouds, of course, are still set in feet. This is slightly off from what we do in the U.S. We actually do set and read our temperatures in degrees Celsius, so that is uh, not standard uh, for what we do in the United States. But there's an easy workaround for this. Uh, if you want to set your temperature in degrees Celsius or read it in degrees Celsius, most of your aircraft have an outside uh, air temperature gauge, and so while you're setting your temperature in the weather menu, you can just take a look at that outside air temperature gauge if it's set degree, to degrees C and um, that will be an easy way to read your Celsius temperature while you're adjusting the temperature. Again, this is the standard for the United States, uh, so it's the system I tend to use, but again, if you're you know, in Europe, you may prefer to use the hybrid system. So the last option we'll look at will actually be in the assistance option, so we'll go back to the main option tab go to the assistance options and this will actually be in failure and damage this is the icing effect option and we have three selections here on visual only or off if we have this set to on uh, anytime we are in icing conditions we, we, we will get icing accumulation and it will be visible and it will have an effect on aircraft performance uh, what that means is that ice will uh, accumulate on the airframe. It will accumulate in the engine components that are susceptible to icing and on things like the pitot tube. Airframe ice will have effects like uh, if it accumulates on the windshield and you don't have windshield anti-icing or de-icing, uh, it will the windshield will frost over or uh, glaze over and it will become more difficult to see. Uh, and then things like the airframe, you'll get uh, ice on places like the wing and the tail. Uh, and this will do a couple of things. It'll increase the weight of the aircraft and it also disrupts the, the airflow over the wing, the more ice accumulates. And so if you don't have de-icing or anti-icing systems on the wing, you'll notice that the aircraft will start to perform more poorly. Uh, it will not be able to climb as well and eventually it may not be able to climb as all at, at, at all. Um, it will also, uh, you may see the aircraft slowing down even if you have the normal cruise power set, uh, you may lose airspeed, and eventually you can get enough icing where your stall speed increases and you can uh, have trouble maintaining altitude. Uh, you can also get it in the engine with carburetor icing. I don't think it does this quite as realistic, but you can end up losing uh, engine power if you don't have engine anti-ice or your carburetor heat on. And it can, it does depend on what kind of engine you are flying with, but it can result in a loss of power or even an engine failure. So with this set to on, uh, you'll get those types of effects. Oh, you also get the uh, pedo icing if you don't have pedo heat or don't have the pedo heat turned on, which can block up your pedo tube. If you have it selected to visual only, then you will see the ice accumulate just like you will with it on, uh, but it won't have any performance effects at all. It'll be a, just kind of a decoration. And then if you have it set to off, then even if you are in conditions that will uh, make icing uh, conditions possible, uh, you will get no icing. It'll be like the conditions don't exist. Uh, just a warning here that anytime you are in clouds or precipitation in flight simulator and the temperature is at or below freezing at your altitude in flight simulator, you will get icing if uh, your icing options are set to on and it will have an effect or if it's set to visual, you will get the visual icing. So it will, it's in the real world, it's very variable as to where icing conditions occur and it's not always predictable but in flight simulator anytime you're in the clouds or precipitation and the temperature is below freezing you will get icing and as i mentioned earlier all of these options are available from the main menu through the options menu but you can also access them from a flight by hitting the escape key and that will bring up your general options on the bottom left hand side and your system assistance options where the icing options are uh, in the top right. 
So one of the ways we can set weather in Flight Sim is through the world map, although there are some limitations on what we can do with that. So if we go into the world map, this brings up our flight setup uh, screen that we're used to using on this channel to set up our flights. We typically go left to right to get everything set up. Uh, you do want to go ahead and enter an airport in here, whatever airport you're going to be departing from, because that way you will be setting the time correctly. Uh, otherwise, it, I think it just sets it to Zulu time automatically if you don't have an airport selected. So we'll go ahead and select Pine Bluff, which is where we usually operate at. And then uh, to get into the weather menu, we want to go to flight conditions. And that brings us a, a menu with a couple of different options here. Uh, obviously, the multiplayer and air traffic don't have anything to do with what the weather is doing. Uh, weather and time, this is kind of a redundant menu that you don't really need to use. You've got three options to set live, preset, or custom, but they don't really take. And then... Um, if you set a preset over here, you toggle live weather on, that's when it, what's going to take precedence over this menu. So these are kind of redundant and don't really do anything. So uh, don't worry about these too much over here. We can set the time and the date from here. You can also set it to real time. So it will set it to the time and day uh, that it is currently in the real world uh, if you want to do that. There is a little quirk with the time setting here uh, in that you'll notice if I drag this slider, uh, the UTC time and the local time show the same. So what it's really doing here is setting the time in UTC. This is a little bug with this system. So I would recommend not setting the time from this menu. I would set it from uh, the little slider on the bottom left hand uh, corner of the world map. And you can see when I do that, when I move that, it shows a different local time than a Zulu time. So it is now setting the time correctly. Uh, but uh, you can set the date and the year and the day, the month, day, and the year from this menu if you'd like to do that. From this menu, you can also toggle live weather on and off. When you toggle live weather, that will just take the current weather that's in the world and it will put it into the sim. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to doing this. Uh, I personally don't like to use it that much. Uh, in the past, it has not been an had not been accurate, particularly when it comes to uh, ceiling and visibility. Those are also often uh, quite a bit off from what they are in the real world. And uh, there are also large areas in the world between reporting stations uh, where you may not get you know, weather reports. So the weather is going to kind of have to guess what's going on there uh, and may or may not fill in accurately what the weather is actually like at those locations. Uh, if you want to fly instrument approaches, the other disadvantage is you're going to have to go somewhere where the weather is IFR at that time, and uh, you won't be able to control whether there's icing or not. Uh, so that's the reasons I use custom weather rather than live weather. I'd like to have control over what I'm doing. If I want to practice instrument approaches, I want to set specific ceilings and visibilities, and you can't do that with live weather. There are advantages, of course, of using live weather, you're going to get more detailed surface and uh, winds aloft and more accurate. Uh, it's going to be hard to set up the winds aloft so that they are accurate over the entire world from using the weather customizations. This is also really good if you want to use live traffic or virtual ATC like a VAT sim type service. Uh, if you import the live weather, you know the winds are going to be accurate and you know that you're going to be flying the same ground speed as everybody else, say, when you're on approach, if you're flying like into a busy Class B air sport, airspace with a jetliner. You know, if your weather is different than what's in the real world and what everybody else is using, if everybody else has a 30 knot headwind on final and you have a calm wind, you're going to be overtaking everybody by 30 knots. Uh, so those are places where you'd want to consider using live weather. Uh, the other option that works from this weather menu is the weather presets, and we'll, we'll talk about those here in a little bit. But those are the only two options that work from this weather menu. You can set the time and date. You can set to live weather. You can set weather presets. But if you try to uh, set weather customization, if you try to customize your ceiling, your visibility, precipitation, whether there's snow on the ground from this menu, it will not import into your session. You have to do that from the weather menu in uh, your flight session. So that's another little bug that's in this main weather menu. Uh, so let's go take a look at the in session or in flight weather menu and how those settings work. 
So we have spawned into our session on the ground here in Pine Bluff, and let's take a look at the in-session weather menu. In order to access this menu, we go up to the top quick menu up here, and then we click on the little uh, icon that looks like a cloud, and that brings up our in-session weather menu. You can see it looks pretty much the same as the weather menu we had in the world map. It has the same fields. We have a panel up here for adjusting the time. Uh, we have a toggle for turning live weather on and off. We have uh, our weather presets we can select from. Uh, and then everything below this now works correctly. It will actually change the weather now. Uh, so we have a menu for, uh, or an area here for setting uh, clouds, setting the uh, height and coverage and all that sort of stuff. If you actually click on a cloud layer, it will take you into a separate cloud layer menu for that particular cloud layer. And we'll go into detail on this here in a little bit. We also have the ability to add or change wind layers. And if we click on the wind layer, that will bring up a separate wind menu for us to adjust the wind. And then over on this side, we have an altitude calculation. And again, we'll go into detail on all this as we go through the lesson here. Uh, an altitude calculation as to where you want to set your weather, a precipitation slider, a snow depth slider, a lightning uh, slider that allows you to adjust the frequency of lightning, a temperature slider, uh, a pressure slider, this is actually an altimeter setting slider, and then a humidity slider. And then we have a toggle down here at the very bottom. It says show 3D thermal. What this does is it will allow you to see the winds and the wind currents, and that also allows you to see where the wind is flowing upwards. In other words, where the thermals are if you want to do some glider flying. Uh, so we'll go all through through all of this and uh, talk about in detail how to adjust all of these. One neat feature of the menus now is, uh, of course, with the sliders, you can slide things back and forth uh, and adjust the, the values there. But you'll notice it does skip over a lot of numbers. It's not very precise. But a nice little feature that was added in Sim Update 10 is if you mouse over and highlight that cursor now and then use your mouse wheel, you can make fine adjustments. You can see now I can adjust this uh, time by just one minute. If I go down here to the precipitation and highlight that, I can uh, adjust that in hundreds of an inch an hour. Uh, so it makes for nice fine adjustments there. The only one it's a little quirky, a little buggy on is with the cloud heights. That doesn't work quite correctly just yet, but that's a nice feature that they added in Sim Update 10. So the time menu is pretty straightforward and works just like it did in the world map weather menu. You can toggle real time, which will set uh, your clock, set the time in the simulator uh, to whatever the time and date is at that location in the real world at that time. Uh, just be aware that if you toggle this on, you can't toggle it off. In order to get it off, you have to go down here and adjust the date or the time, and then it will uh, detoggle real time, and you'll have to uh, decide, you know, set your, your date and time from there. Uh, it will still have the time and date that you had that the real time was set to, uh, so you have to readjust it back to whatever you want. Uh, you also have the toggle for live weather. If you turn this on, then it will automatically uh, change the weather everywhere in the world to what it is in the real world as it's getting that live uh, data weather stream. When you toggle this off, it will just go back to whatever the weather preset is that you had set before you toggled the live weather on. So looking at the uh, weather presets, that's this tab right here. If you click on that, it will bring up uh, a bunch of different options uh, for what you can uh, use as presets here. Live weather is one of them. Uh, clear skies just gives you uh, completely clear skies, no clouds, uh, no humidity, uh, and light winds. And then a few clouds will give you kind of a lower layer of kind of fair weather cumulus clouds and then a mid-level layer of kind of alto cumulus and then a, a high scattered layer of cirrus clouds. So this is kind of a good setting for just a, kind of a fair weather VFR sort of day. Uh, scattered clouds will give you a little more coverage on the clouds. This to me looks a little closer to broken than scattered, uh, but it's the same sort of setting just with a little more coverage. And then a broken uh, cloud setting will give you Again, a little more coverage uh, so that, you know, you've got kind of uh, a broken layer that you're going to have to have find some holes uh, to climb through if you're a VFR pilot. Uh, high level clouds does that. It just gives you a kind of a high serious layer. This is good for like effects, especially at sunset and things like that. 
Overcast will give you a lower overcast cover. I don't think it's an IFR uh, cover. It's you know, about 5,000 feet where the bases are here. Um, so just kind of a overcast day. And then uh, rain obviously is going to give you rainy conditions. Uh, and then uh, thunderstorm or snow will give you snowy conditions with uh, some snow depth on the ground. So kind of a winter wonderland there. And then... Uh, See, the next one is storms. This will give you uh, thunderstorms going on in the area. And then you have uh, conditions for uh, soaring as well. And you can see if we put these conditions in and we'll trigger the 3D thermals, we can actually see, see the wind currents. So we can see over here uh, to the southeast of the field, we do have a good updraft going that a glider could take advantage of. As far as the presets that I tend to use in my personal flying and in making uh, the training videos, uh, Clear Skies is one that I use to set up for basic beginner level VFR flying. Uh, I think the few clouds sets up for a nice kind of fair weather uh, cumulus sort of VFR day, although I do typically raise the cloud heights a little bit, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Uh, scattered and broken cloud cover works to set up those two kind of more coverage sorts of things. The high level is good for, you know, kind of a nice aesthetic day, especially for doing sunsets. Uh, I don't typically use the overcast or the rain. I like to set up that sort of weather on my own. Same thing with the snow. Uh, the storm is actually a good setting, and it's probably one of the most frequently used, I think, to get stormy weather because it puts in the, all the clouds that you need, precipitation, lightning, temperatures, and wind settings to give you that kind of thunderstorm turbulence. And setting that all up on your own is kind of a cumbersome endeavor. Uh, so I do like to use that storm setting to set up kind of stormy weather if I want to navigate through that. Another neat thing about the weather presets is that once you've set them, they are not set in stone. You can actually manipulate them. So you can use a preset to get you close to the weather conditions you want and then kind of manipulate them a little bit to get exactly what you want. An example of this would be, again, the few clouds setting. Sets you up with a nice kind of uh, fair weather cumulus sort of environment. But if you look at the cloud layer here, it is set pretty low. Uh, 1,600 feet is pretty low for VFR flying, and you're going to have to be dodging through a lot of those clouds. So I'll go through here, and I will adjust this, and I'll pull the bases of the clouds up to about 5,500 feet. That gives me uh, a good uh, room for VFR flying there. And then I'll pull the tops up to about the thickness that they were earlier, uh, about 14,000 feet would be about as much thickness. And this still has the same sort of uh, effect with the clouds, uh, but now the bases are quite a bit higher and I can fly VFR under the clouds rather than having to dodge around them. Another neat thing that you can do is with these tabs over here is if you set a uh, weather setting uh, that you would like to keep to call back later, you just click on this folder option here and then it brings up a thing for naming it. So I will call this... Uh, VFR uh, cumulus. I'll go ahead and put the airport identifier in there, and then I can save that to this computer. And if I want to pull up the setting in the future, it will be down at the bottom of the menu here, and I can just pull up that setting. When I have a custom setting that I have built, I can uh, go in and I get these other menu options to pop up here where I can have. Uh, the trash can to delete it here or I can go into settings and it gives me the option to uh, edit the name as well. So let's dig into the details of how we can customize our weather using the main body of this uh, weather options menu. The first setting we'll look at is altitude calculation. Uh, this has two settings AMGL or above mean ground level or AMSL which is above mean sea level. If you set this uh, to AMGL, this is particularly important for things like cloud heights, wind heights, and temperatures. Uh, this will set those settings so that uh, whatever the elevation of the land that you're flying is, that's where those weather settings will be set. So an, an example of this would be if I'm flying over land that is at sea level or flying over the ocean, which is also at sea level, and I set the temperature to 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius, 
then that temperature will be 15 uh, will be 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius at sea level. If I set this the same way and I'm at Denver, which is at 5,500 feet roughly, uh, it will set the temperature so it's 59 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius at Denver at 5,500 feet. If I am over the top of Mount Elbert, which is 14,400 feet, and I have the temperature setting set like this, the temperature over the top of Mount Elbert will be uh, 59 degrees or 15 degrees Celsius at the top of Mount Elbert at 14,400 feet. And this is not realistic to the way the atmosphere really works. Typically, the atmosphere will cool as you go higher, and we'll talk more in depth about here that, that here in just a little bit. Uh, but if you have it, set to this mean ground level setting, your cloud heights, your wind levels, and your temperatures will contour to the terrain. In other words, as the terrain goes up, that temperature that you set will uh, follow that terrain up. Same thing is true with the cloud setting. If you, if you set your cloud base, say, at 1,000 feet, uh, it will set a cloud base at 1,000 feet above the ground, which means over sea level, it's going to be at 1,000 feet. Uh, above mean sea level or on your altimeter, but as you go over higher terrain, that cloud base is going to lift. For this reason, I like to use the AMSL setting. Uh, it's a little more realistic. You do have to do some math with uh, where your cloud bases are going to be uh, in, rel in relation to the terrain and things like that, uh, but it makes for a more realistic environment where the temperature is going to decrease as you go higher and you won't be flying over the top of Mount Whitney and it being way higher, uh, a temperature way higher than, than normal. So my preference is to set this to above mean sea level and then do kind of my math to figure out where the clouds and temperatures and things like that need to be from there. So looking at our weather options in this main weather panel here, we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. And the first slider that we have is for humidity. This increases the amount of moisture you have in the air. You can set the slider between 1 and 20. It doesn't really tell you what those denote. I'm assuming 1 is zero relative humidity and 20 is probably 100% relative humidity, uh, but it doesn't tell anywhere. So if you know anything about that, let us know in the comment section. And humidity does two things for you uh, in real life uh, and in flight simulator. I know it does at least one. Well, uh, I don't really know if it does the second one. But if you increase this slider uh, and bring the humidity level up, uh, you can see it provides this sort of uh, kind of a hazy effect for you. And this is true to life. When you have humid air in real life, it is going to be a little hazier and the visibility is going to be a little lower. And of course, you can increase it all the way to 20 and the air gets quite hazy and the visibility uh, fairly low. And another thing that is realistic about it in Flight Simulator is if you are looking through the haze into the sun, uh, like you would if you're flying into sunrise or sunset, you can see that decreases the visibility even more versus where if it's over your head or you're not looking directly into the sun, uh, the visibility is not quite as bad. So that is accurate to real life and replicated in Flight Simulator. The other thing that humidity, high humidity will do in the real life is it affects uh, aircraft performance. It affects the amount of power that piston engines put out. Uh, it does not affect turboprop or turbojet engines, but it does affect piston engines. And I don't know if that uh, effect is replicated in Flight Simulator. I haven't tested out. So just be aware that if you increase your relative humidity up to a relatively high level, you may be getting less horsepower out of your engine. I don't think it's quite as dramatic as the effects you'll have with high altitude and high temperatures, uh, but in the real world, it does have an effect on aircraft performance. So the next slider up is our slider for adjusting atmospheric pressure, and we uh, read the atmospheric pressure as an altimeter setting. There is a slight difference. Uh, the altimeter setting is the barometric pressure at a given station adjusted to read what it would read if the station was located at sea level. So that way you can set your altimeter uh, to that setting and should read the correct altitude regardless of what elevation you're located at. Uh, you can adjust it down. Uh, the low point is 2799 or about 28 inches and the high point is about 32 inches. What's considered the standard uh, barometric pressure is 2992 uh, on the inches and anything lower than that is considered lower than standard. Anything higher than that is considered higher than standard. You'll notice when I uh, adjust the pressure up and down that that does make the altitude change on the altimeter. When I lower the pressure, since it's a pressure sensitive instrument that makes it think it's at, think it's at a higher altitude, that's why we have our altimeter set 
uh, at the bottom of the altimeter there or on the side on a on a analog altimeter and we can change uh, whatever uh, we have in here to the current altimeter reading and it will read the correct altitude. You'll notice if the pressure drops that makes the uh, altitude go up so if you don't set your altimeter and the pressure is lower your aircraft is going to be higher than it actually is or your aircraft is going your altimeter is going to indicate that it's higher than it actually is and if you have a high pressure uh, your, your aircraft is going to indicate uh, that it is lower than it actually is. You can see we actually have dropped below sea level here when I brought it up above 30 inches there. Another effect that the pressure has on aircraft is performance. If you uh, have a very low barometric pressure, uh, that air is going to be quite a bit thinner, the same as it would be at high elevations and high temperatures. So your aircraft is going to perform more poorly in low pressure. And if you have a very high barometric pressure, the air is going to be quite a bit thicker, more oxygen molecules packed in a in the same amount of air, uh, so the aircraft is going to perform better. So if you want to artificially enhance your aircraft's performance, one way to do it is to crank up the barometric pressure as high as it will go and your aircraft will perform well. Just don't forget to adjust your altimeter setting. So the next slider up is the temperature slider. I don't know why they have this listed as temperature MSL slash ISA plus 10 degrees Celsius. This doesn't really mean anything. Uh, basically, you can do two things with this slider, and it's dependent on what your altitude calculation is set to. If you have this set to AMGL, it will set your temperature at the elevation that you're currently at if you're on the ground, or the land that you're flying, the elevation of the land you're flying over if you're in the air. If you say it, set it to AMSL, it will set the temperature uh, that you've selected at sea level. Uh, so let's take a look at an example of how this works. I'm currently sitting on the ramp uh, at Denver International Airport. The elevation of the field here is 5,420 feet plus or minus. And uh, you can see if I set AMGL in here and I set my temperature to 15 degrees Celsius, that sets the temperature here at Denver at 5,420 feet to 15 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's important to know, and we'll talk more about this in depth here in just a second, but the atmosphere gets colder as you climb higher, uh, and in flight simulator, it gets colder at a rate of 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet. So for every 1,000 feet you go up, uh, your temperature decreases by 2 degrees C. When you have this set to AMGL, that means that this temperature is going to contour to the elevation. In other words, if I take off from Denver and I fly to the east and the terrain drops down to 4,000 feet, the temperature will be 4,000 feet uh, it will be, excuse me, it'll be 15 degrees at 4,000 feet. If I take off and head to the west and fly over the mountains, uh, if I flow, fly over a field that has an elevation of 8,000 feet, the temperature at that uh, airport at 8,000 feet will be, again, 15 degrees Celsius. And because of the way the atmosphere cools as it goes higher, as you fly over high elevations, this means that you're flying through higher temperatures. And that's kind of an unrealistic atmospheric profile. The temperature is going to be a lot uh, warmer aloft than it probably should be, uh, and that is going to affect your aircraft performance, and it affects things like contrails. Uh, if I set this to AMSL, again, it sets whatever value I've selected here to that temperature at sea level, and again, the atmosphere in flight simulator cools at 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 1, feet, so at 5,000 feet, it's roughly 10 degrees colder, a little more because we're at 5,400 feet. Uh, so you can see the temperature, even though I've set it at 15 degrees at sea level, it is 4 degrees Celsius here. So my personal preference on this is to set this to AMSL, and then if I have an aircraft that has an outside air temperature gauge, which is most of them in Flight Simulator, I just take a look at what the temperature is on that temperature gauge, and I adjust it accordingly to get the temperature that I want at that station, but to still have a nice realistic uh, profile uh, as I climb that the air, air is going to get uh, cooler and be a realistic temperature at altitude. So let's talk in a little more depth about the lapse rate. As we mentioned earlier, as altitude increases in the atmosphere, the temperature decreases, and the rate at which it decreases is called the lapse rate. In the real world, the lapse rate can vary. It's not always the same, and the temperature can even increase with altitude to a certain extent, which is called a temperature inversion. 
the standard lapse rate or what we use as a standard lapse rate uh, for what they call the uh, International Standard Atmosphere or ISA is two degrees Celsius or three and a half degrees Fahrenheit per 1000 feet. So that means for every 1000 feet you climb, the temperature is going to decrease by two degrees Celsius. And in Microsoft Flight Simulator, when you're not using live weather, the lapse rate will always be standard. There's no way uh, to change the temperatures aloft or to change the lapse rate. You set the temperature either at sea level or at the elevation of the land that you're either uh, on the ground at or flying over, and then it decreases automatically two degrees Celsius per thousand feet from there. In Microsoft Flight Simulator, you can use the temperature and the lapse rate to determine where the freezing level is. And the freezing level is just the altitude where the temperature is going to be at or below freezing, at or below zero degrees Celsius. To do this, you divide the temperature at your elevation or altitude by two, and then multiply by a thousand to figure out where the freeze level is relative to your current elevation or altitude. Here's a couple of examples of that. Let's assume that we're at sea level and that the temperature is 15 degrees C at sea level or standard. Uh, so since we are at uh, zero uh, feet MSL, temperature is 15, I divide that by two, that equals 7.5. I multiply that times 1,000, that's 7,500. I add that to zero feet MSL. And that means that the freeze level in uh, my current location is going to be 7,500 feet on the altimeter, or 7,500 feet MSL. So looking at a departure from Denver, which has an elevation of roughly 5,400 feet MSL, let's assume that the temperature is 10 degrees C. So 10 divided by 2 is 5 times 1,000 is 5,000. So the freezing level is going to be 5,000 feet higher than where we currently are. So if we take the Denver's elevation of 5,400 feet and add 5,000 feet to that, we come up with a freeze level of 10,400 feet MSL. Last example, let's take a look at if we are sitting in Leadville and the temperature is negative four degrees Celsius. Uh, negative four divided by two is going to be two. I multiply that times a thousand, that's going to be negative 2000. So the freeze level is going to be 2000 feet lower than I'm currently uh, located, where I'm cu currently located. Leadville is, we'll say for simplicity's sake, at 10,000 feet. So I know that I have to reach a elevation or an altitude uh, that's at least 8,000 feet MSL to be at or below the freezing level. So if I take off from Leadville, I know that I'm going to be dealing with icing or uh, well, airframe icing and, and that sort of thing until I can get to a point to where I can descend down below 8,000 feet MSL. And it's important to remember that in Microsoft Flight Simulator, if you have icing enabled, you will always get icing when you are at or above the freezing level and you are in clouds or precipitation. The temperature slider has quite a wide range. It can go down to negative 90 degrees Celsius, which is negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit, so quite chilly. And it can go up to 60 degrees uh, above zero Celsius, which is about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And for uh, reference, the hottest temperature ever recorded on the face of the planet is 134 degrees in Death Valley, I think in the 1920s. Uh, typically, you're not gonna see operating temperatures much above 40 degrees Celsius in most of the world. Um, occasionally, you will see temperatures above that, but most aircraft charts actually only go to 40 or 45 degrees as far as uh, performance charts for aircraft. Another important consideration with temperature is that if you have uh, lower than standard temperatures, that's gonna make the air thicker. So the aircraft is going to perform better uh, if you set your temperatures way cold, colder than normal. And uh, if you set your te temperatures way above normal, particularly if you set it to uh, AMGL, because we can still set our temperature to be uh, 60 degrees Celsius at Denver <laughs> or uh, you know at Leadville, uh, then your aircraft performance is going to be very poor. Uh, so this is a way to artificially enhance or if you want to detract from your aircraft's performance is to set, uh, you know, the temperature way low, uh, make sure you're using sea level so it's as cold as it can possibly get. And then again, you could also drop your pressure down or excuse me, drop, pump your pressure way up and you're going to have, you know, that's a good way to artificially enhance your aircraft's performance. 
So the next setting we have is the lightning setting. In order to have lightning, you have to have clouds. You can see if I ramp this up to 100, it doesn't do anything right now because we don't have any clouds. You can generate it from any layer of cloud that you want. You can generate three layers of clouds, and we'll talk more about making clouds here in just a little bit. Uh, but it looks most effective if you have do it from the lowest level of clouds. So I'll just make us a quick uh, overcast layer here. Uh, to generate our lightning from, and then it's pretty straightforward from there. You have a slider that's 0% to 100%. 0% is no lightning, and 100% is you get a nice lightning show. Uh, this is only a visual effect. It does not produce a thunderstorm. In order to produce a thunderstorm, Manually, you need to generate tall clouds, you need to generate the precipitation, you need to turn on the lightning, and then if you want turbulence, you have to adjust the winds. It's kind of a cumbersome process, so usually if I want to fly in stormy weather or, or uh, try to navigate in stormy weather, I will use the storm setting on the presets, and that will automatically generate areas of thunderstorms, and then you can control how thick it is or how clustered it is using uh, the cloud tool. Uh, but if you just want uh, an effect, you know, sprinkle in some rain here and uh, you've got a nice kind of thunderstormy looking effect if you're looking to do thunderstorms for videos or things like that. So that is how the lightning slider works. The next slider up is the snow depth. It allows you to set the snow depth in inches, supposedly. Uh, this, like the lightning, is just a visual effects slider. You can see as I slide the slider to the right, uh, some surfaces start to get snow quite early, these grassy areas over here, and actually the concrete on the ramp as well. Uh, and then other grassy areas and the trees get covered as I move the slider up. And as I continue to increase it, uh, the slider, we start to get uh, kind of a frosty appearance on some of the taxiways over here. Uh, it's interesting to note that different types of pavement will get uh, snow covered at a different rate and some not at all. It seems like all of the asphalt surfaces in Flight Simulator will always look like they have been uh, treated and cleared, even if you have active snowfall going on. Uh, some of them like this, I don't know what this surface is made of over here, uh, but it is just getting a frosty appearance, uh, so it's not completely snow covered. It looks like it's been kind of sort of scraped off a little bit. And then the concrete uh, will actually be completely snow covered if you have uh, much, uh, if any, snow cover set at all. Uh, and I believe this also degrades braking action on any surfaces that remain snow covered when you when you push this up. Uh, the concrete thing is important to take note because there are runways in the world, some at very large airports, that are made out of concrete. And uh, if you're shooting an instrument approach in snowy conditions and you have some snow depth set or the live weather has some snow depth that set, you'll break out and you won't see many of the runway markings. You'll only be able to see the runway lights. So something to be aware of if you're operating in winter conditions. Again, this is just a decoration. It's kind of like the fake snow on a Christmas display. Uh, it doesn't matter what the temperature is out here. Right now it's 59 degrees uh, Celsius here at Pine Bluff, and uh, this snow will not melt. It's not going to go anywhere. If I sit here for an hour, the snow is not going to melt or decrease in coverage. So it's just kind of like a spray-on decorative type snow uh, that you're using to give yourself uh, some ambiance to your winter flying. And another thing to mention about the uh, snow cover is you can have snow cover regardless of where you are in the world and what temperature you have set, as we talked about earlier. Uh, case in point, welcome to uh, snowy 80 degrees post-apocalyptic uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. So the next slider up is the precipitation slider. You can go between 0 and 1.18 uh, inches per hour or the metric equivalent uh, precipitation to uh, decide how heavy you want to make the rain or snowfall. But you notice, of course, when I don't have any clouds, I don't get even any precipitation. Uh, precipitation is actually generated from the lowest layer of clouds. Uh, so I'll go ahead and pop a lowest layer of clouds. So you need to pick the bottom layer there and actually have some coverage. Uh, and then you can actually vary that coverage and it will get uh, spread out the precipitation. And then all you need to do to get the precipitation is a roll the slider. And the further right you roll it, the heavier the precipitation gets, which will also drop visibility, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Uh, the other thing that you need to know about precipitation is that it will automatically gen generate uh, rain or snow uh, depending on the 
uh, temperature at the altitude you're located at. So if I want to generate snow, I just drop the temperature down to below freezing. And now we have some snowfall. And again, I can change the intensity on that snowfall. Again, it will affect uh, precipit it will affect the visibility when I do that. Uh, the snowfall will not accumulate, though. If you just leave it here and let it go for hours, it won't accumulate. You do need to use the snow depth tool uh, to get any uh, visible indication of accumulation. Another unique thing about precipitation in Flight Simulator is it doesn't you, it doesn't generate a even precipitation field. Uh, I'll bring this the I'm looking at the G1000 with the Nexrad uh, image here, and you notice as I bring bring the precipitation up, uh, it creates these kind of clumps and clusters with areas of no precipitation. Uh, so it's not a uniform shield of precipitation that you're flying through. And uh, we'll talk about this more with the visibility, too, because whether, whether it's raining and how hard it's raining will determine what the visibility is. And because of that, the visibility will go up and down when you have precipitation. It won't remain steady. So for that reason, I don't like to set visibility using precipitation. Uh, but this will show you, you know, even though you get areas of heavy rain, no matter how hard you pull the slider to the right, there are still going to be areas that don't have any rain. It's not going to create this uniform coverage that you can get in real life. Uh, so something to be aware of, and then we'll talk about how uh, precipitation affects visibility. So just a little demo on how precipitation will affect visibility. Uh, we are right now in a uh, active pause above runway 18. I'm just about a thousand feet uh, from the threshold uh, and the runway is about 5,000 feet long or about one statute mile. Uh, so we're probably about 6,000 feet from the opposite end of the runway. So we're seeing about you know 6,000 feet from the aircraft to the end of the runway right here. We'll just uh, go through the different uh, precipitation settings and see how they affect visibility. So a lot of times I'll just kick in 0 0.202 or three or so, and you can see it will drop long range visibility down, but your visibility for uh, the ground level is still pretty good. It still looks like we have over a mile out there. Uh, so if you just want kind of a rain effect and you don't really want to affect your visibility, uh, this is kind of a good setting to have right here. Uh, if you kick it up to about 0.1 to 0.15, you can see we're starting to get to where it's hard to see the end of the runway now. Uh, so I would call this probably close to a mile. And you can see, we'll do a time lapse demonstration here, but you can see there are kind of bands of precipitation moving through that drop the visibility down and pick the visibility up. Uh, so it's not necessarily steady visibility. Uh, then if I ratchet it up to about 0.25 or so, uh, that starts to pull the visibility down to where I can only see about halfway down the runway. So I'd say about mm, 0.25 to 0.4 or so is going to give you about a half a mile or so of visibility. Uh, plus or minus somewhere around in there. And again, you can see as the rain moves through, it waxes and wanes. And then um, if I kick it up up to about uh, 0.5 or so, now I'm getting to where I can uh, barely see past the 1,000 foot marker. So maybe 2,000 feet from the uh, airplane right now. And again, it's coming in and out, uh, depending on how heavy the precipitation is as it moves through. Uh, so up around 0.5. 4 to 0.5, you're going to get, you know, looks like about a quarter mile visibility. And then if you ratchet it up uh, beyond that, then you get to where it's down to a quarter mile or less. Uh, so that's how uh, vis precipitation will be affected by visibility. And again, you will see uh, that it's also showery precipitation. It's not steady and it does move even if you don't have any wind. The precipitation will move through and it'll become more intense and less intense and the visibility will drop and then go back up. Uh, so you're, if you're using rain to do visibility, uh, you're not going to get a consistent visibility. It's not my preferred method. I just use low clouds and then adjust the cloud density, and we'll talk about how to do that. Uh, but precipitation can be a very uh, mixed bag. I mostly use it for effect uh, rather than actually trying to dial in the visibility to a certain level. 
To the left of the main weather settings menu is the cloud and wind menu. On the left side, we have uh, cloud uh, layers that we can change. And on the right side, we have wind. So we'll focus on the clouds first. Uh, you can actually grab these cloud layers. There are three cloud layers, and you cannot add or subtract uh, the layers. Uh, there are only three, and you can't increase or decrease those. Uh, and then you can actually click on the cloud layer, and it brings up a submenu to manipulate that particular cloud layer. And then you can also uh, bring the height of the cloud up and down just by dragging it with the mouse as well. Uh, in order for clouds to display, uh, you need three things. You need your coverage to be more than zero. You need your density to be more than zero. And then the top and bottom of the cloud can't be at the same altitude. You'll notice if I uh, bring the coverage up right now with this lowest layer of clouds, uh, nothing happens. It doesn't display anything, and that's because I have the cloud base thickness basically set to zero feet. So in order to get that cloud layer to display, I need to uh, increase the thickness of the cloud. At least 2,000 feet is the minimum about that you want for some clouds to display. Uh, but the higher you make the tops, the thicker the clouds are going to appear. So there are five different ways to manipulate an individual cloud layer. You can increase or decrease the uh, altitude of the base of the cloud. You can increase or decrease the altitude of the top of the cloud. There's a slider called scatter, which we'll talk about here more in just a little bit. You can increase or decrease the density of the cloud, and then you can increase or decrease the coverage of the cloud layer. Uh, so the coverage, again, you need a little bit of thickness to be able to see any clouds, uh, but the coverage basically determines how much of the sky uh, the cloud layer covers. So if you're at 10%, you're only getting 10% of the sky covered. Uh, if you go up to 33%, uh, 30% or so, uh, then you're going to get like a scattered type layer. Uh, more than 50%, it's going to start to trend towards broken. And then, of course, if you go to 100%, you're going to uh, get an overcast layer. And then um, the density uh, determines uh, basically the thickness of the cloud, how you know dense the cloud is. Uh, it will affect the cloud's visibility, and it also appears how, affects how the cloud appears, uh, how dark it appears. If you go to a lower density, uh, if you're inside the cloud, you'll be able to see further inside of the cloud, and it gets a little lighter appearance, whereas if you go heavier on the density, uh, it gets a little darker appearance, and the visibility in the cloud is going to be a little lower. And we'll talk about this here in a little bit, how you can use this to adjust uh, if you want to use low clouds to have visibility and fog set uh, appropriately for shooting instrument approaches. I haven't found any clear definition of what scatter does, uh, so if you have found that, please let us know in the comment section. But it basically, it seems to change the distribution of the clouds, and it, it behaves in kind of a strange way. It seems to, we'll set the uh, coverage here to about 35% mm, or so. It seems to kind of increase or decrease the distribution initially uh, and then it goes up to about 70 percent and then it kind of starts to decrease it a little bit so you know that's what moving the slider does it just seems to change kind of where, how the cloud layer is distributed so if you want kind of a more scattered distribution over towards 65 percent or so seems to be a good setting for like a, a fair weather cumulus type of cloud setting. And again, uh, you can increase the bases and the tops of the clouds. Right now, I've got the bases set at 47-ish hundred feet. And if you increase the thickness of the cloud by either decreasing the base uh, or increasing the top, you can get, uh, you know, kind of a, a puffier effect uh, working towards like a towering cumulus effect with a scattered layer. Uh, and the clouds will get darker as you do that. Um, and then, it, you know, as you if you make the cloud less thick, you're going to uh, make it appear thinner. And of course, if you match the two altitudes up, then the cloud layer is going to dis disappear uh, completely. And so, you know, working with the cloud layers and getting them looking like you want them to look is as much art as it is science. And again, there are some good presets that you can go in and use and then kind of manipulate to get what you want. Uh, but you can also just sit here and play around with them. So let's talk about some of the different effects we can set up and the way we can manipulate the cloud layers uh, to get some different looks in the sim. So the top layer of clouds uh, can be used to create uh, kind of a cirrus sort of effect. I like to set these usually 
uh, somewhere up above 30,000 feet, uh, up to even 40,000 feet for the bases. And usually you want to make them two to 4,000 feet thick uh, to get kind of a good effect from them. And uh, these clouds will give you kind of those wispy sort of uh, cirrus cloud uh, effects there. You can see it's kind of a fair weather uh, cirrus cloud there. These, uh, even if you bring them to 100% coverage, uh, they're not going to be overly thick. And the other thing they're really good for is having uh, like sunset effects where you have the cloud glow uh, early in the morning, the red, the red sky effect. Uh, these are really good clouds to set up to have that sort of effect. So the middle layer of clouds, you uh, typically set somewhere between, usually in the 20s, uh, with the low end usually on around 20,000 feet. And again, you want this layer to be eh, between probably three and 6,000 feet thick, and it's mostly going to be an effects type layer. Uh, you use this to do what they're called alto cumulus, uh, if you want uh, kind of some higher level uh, puffy cloud covers, and then you can increase the cloud coverage to get kind of that... Uh, uh, alto cumulus, alto stratus type effect up there. And then if you want, you can go to 100% coverage and thicken it up a little bit uh, to get kind of that high overcast uh, cloud cover if you're looking for that sort of effect. You can also uh, layer these clouds in between each other. The tops and bottoms of the clouds can uh, intermingle if you want cloud layers touching to give kind of a layered effect. Uh, so that effect is available to you as well. The lowest layer of clouds is the one that you can do the most with in terms of varied effects. Uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, if you set it to uh, a couple, you know, four to five thousand feet thick, uh, set your scatter up around sixty to seventy percent or so, it'll give you a real good uh, fair weather cumulus type of effect. Uh, you can increase the tops on this type of thing to give yourself like a towering cumulus. Uh, you can lower the bases down and increase your coverage uh, to get kind of a broken level uh, if you want to challenge yourself with you know trying to get through a sucker hole and getting on top and then getting back down through uh, some sort of hole in the clouds you can create that effect with that and of course you have the ability to go to uh, completely overcast and have an overclass cloud cover and then if you increase the tops on this depending on where you set the tops, uh, that'll determine you know, how much sunlight is blocked and how dark it is at the surface. Uh, so this is a good setup for setting up like kind of a rainy day or just a dreary overcast day. Uh, that's the effect you want to use for that. Setting the cloud bases and tops is a little bit tricky because the uh, altitude that the bases are actually going to be at and the tops are going to be at is going to be a little bit different than what you put in the boxes to calibrate them over here. Uh, I've noticed that the uh, bases tend to be significantly higher and the base isn't a, a well-defined thing uh, than what you put in the box. And then the tops tend to be significantly lower than what you put in the box over here. So we'll take a look at this. We're out in Aspen on a uh, active pause at 9,000 feet uh, near the airport, uh, looking to the uh, south southeast here towards some terrain over there. So we can see uh, I've got a uh, the lowest layer set up with a top of 28 or 20,860 feet, a base at 14,804, uh, and we'll kind of manipulate this to see what happens. You can see as I bring it down. Whoops, I'm going up, not down. There we go. Now we're bringing it down. Uh, I get down to about uh, 11,000 feet, 12,000 feet, and it starts to cover the mountains. That's about right for out here. But then you'll notice as I bring it down to within about 1,000 feet of my altitude, I start to get immersed in a little bit of the haze, but I'm still well underneath the cloud base. I still have pretty good visibility uh, forward and certainly down. And even as I bring it to my altitude, I'm at uh, 9,000 feet. So when I set it at 9,000 feet, again, I still have really good forward visibility. If I was shooting an instrument approach, I would have broken out and gotten the field already. And uh, uh, downwards, I have uh, very significant, it's almost uh, not impeded visibility. In fact, you have to bring that cloud base down uh, at least uh, 2,000 feet, closer to 2,500 feet underneath your aircraft's altitude to be completely immersed in it to where you don't have any visibility forward or down. Uh, so that plays a role in where you want to set your clouds for doing things like set, uh, uh, practicing instrument approaches, and we'll talk about specific details on how we do that here in just a second. Let's take a look first at how we work with the tops. 
So looking at the uh, cloud tops, again, uh, they're going to be significantly lower than what you set in the altitude top for your cloud layer uh, in the box over here. I've got myself in a slew mode at 7,000 feet, and you can see I've got the cloud top set at 7,000 feet, and they're well underneath my aircraft. In fact, I'll descend in the slew mode here, and you can see I have to get down to about 5,500 feet, so almost 1,500 feet below where I've set the tops to get into the clouds. And the other thing you'll notice about the cloud tops is that they're not even. I go over here and the cloud tops are a little bit lower. I come uh, over to this area over here and the cloud tops are a little bit higher. Uh, so it's not an even overcast uh, like you sometimes have with uh, straightest clouds in the real world. Uh, I mean, sometimes in the real world they can be, you know, uh, uneven tops like this. But for uh, a nice even uh, stratus layer in the real world, it's typically a little more even. You don't have the big swings because we have swings of upwards of a thousand feet and where the tops are. Now, if you had cumulus clouds, that would be a little bit different, but typically the stratus layers are a little more even than that. So if you want your tops at a certain uh, height, uh, if you want to break out at a certain point, just be aware that you're going to need to put the tops probably somewhere between a thousand feet and 1500 feet higher uh, than what it actually says in the box. And one more quick thing I'll mention about the tops is that even though it will let you uh, pull the cloud tops all the way up to 60,000 feet, it won't generate tops much above 45,000 feet or so. So that's about as tall as you can make your clouds. And I've seen with like thunderstorms, when I've tried to pull it up above 35, it really hasn't taken the tops up about up above 35. Uh, so they will be significantly lower uh, if you want to put the tops at a very high altitude. So as far as setting up uh, clouds for instrument approaches, there is a formula that works pretty consistently. Uh, it's a little bit different depending on whether you're shooting a precision versus a non-precision approach, uh, what your minimums are and what the visibility is required. But for a standard ILS that has a half mile visibility minimums or 2400 foot RVR minimums, uh, what you want to do is go to your lowest cloud layer and set it to 100% uh, coverage and then uh, make it so that the tops will make the cloud layer uh, at least four or 5,000 feet thick. If you want it a little darker, put the tops a little higher. And then for the minimums, uh, what you want to do is you want to take your minimums on your approach plate. We're looking at the ILS uh, runway 5 into uh, Groton, New London, uh, Connecticut, uh, which is as an identifier of Kilo Golf Oscar November. The minimums for the straight end to ILS uh, the ILS to runway 5 are 208 feet and then again 2400 uh, RVR or half a mile visibility. And so we want to, what we want to do is take that minimum of 208 and subtract uh, 1400 feet. So that brings us to negative 1192 feet. So we'll go into this bottom altitude and you can try to put this in here uh, with the slider, but it, honestly, it's easier to go in and do it. So what I do is I go in and take the value out, and then I just enter the value that I want without the negative first. So 1192, I hit delete to get rid of that zero. Then I go to the front and I put in um, the negative symbol there and then hit enter, and that will lower it, down, lower it down to the ceiling that I want. You can set the bases of clouds uh, as low as negative 1600 uh, feet and some change, I believe. Also make sure that you have your altitude calculation in AMSL, uh, otherwise this method doesn't work. Uh, and then leave the density at 1.0, and that should give you a nice uh, cloud layer that will have you breaking out to where you can get a little bit of uh, ground contact around 300 feet above the airport. And then as you get within 50 to 100 feet of your minimums, you should start picking up the approach lights. And then before you get to 100 feet above the touchdown zone elevation, you should be able to see the runway. If you want to make sure that you're going to get in every time, maybe bump the bases up 100 or 200 feet from that. Uh, but this should be a good consistent formula for you to set your clouds for shooting ILS approaches that, again, have these... Uh, half mile minimums and these 200 foot ceilings. If the ceiling is a little higher, again, you're gonna to need to bump the uh, altitude up a little bit uh, 
according to that formula. And then if, if it's a higher visibility approach, if it's a three quarter mile approach, you'll want to bump the density down to a little less than one, uh, probably about uh, 0.75 or so should work for that. Let's take a look at setting minimums for a non-precision approach. A formula that works really well for flying non-precision approaches to runways that don't have approach lighting systems where your visibility minimums are typically going to be a mile or so and your uh, decision altitude and or your MDA is going to be 300 foot or so uh, is to take the minimums on the plate. For example, in this example, we're looking at the RNAV. Uh, GPS to runway 4 at Conway Regional in Conway, Arkansas. The identifier there is Kilo Charlie X-Ray Whiskey. And the minimums for the LPA, LPV uh, GRNAV GPS approach are 583 feet. So what I want to do is uh, take uh, 583 feet and I'll take away 1,000 feet for this one. And rather than 1,400 feet, that'll give us a little more visibility and a little higher uh, ceiling there. Uh, so that would be if I take uh, 583, take away 1,000, that's going to come up with negative 417 feet. Uh, so again, inc increase my coverage to 100%. I'm going to drop my cloud density down to about 0.5, and that should give me about a mile of visibility. Uh, and then uh, tops are fine at 8200. That's going to give us plenty of thickness there to have a good thick cloud layer. And then again, I'll enter the uh, value that I want in here manually. So I'll put in 417, get rid of the zero, and put the negative in there. And this should give us a base to where, as we're approaching our minimums, we're going to have a mile of visibility. We'll be just enough underneath the bulk of the cloud layer to be able to get a good visual picture of the runway as we get to our minimums and make that visual landing from there. So this is a good uh, formula to use for those, again, non-precision approaches where your decision height or your MDA is up around three or 400 feet and uh, your visibility is about a mile. If you're flying approaches that need a higher visibility than that, then you're going to need to drop your cloud density down a little bit as well. Uh, the formula seems to work pretty well for most approaches. I've even flown a circling approach using that ceiling formula, and it seems to work well for all non-precision approaches. One more thing that you can do with the cloud layer is to create a ground fog effect. To do this, you want to use your lowest cloud layer again. You want to pump the coverage up to 100%. Uh, you will want to pump the density up initially to 5. This will give you a nice thick fog layer here. Then you want to drop the bottom altitude all the way down to as low as it will go. And again, make sure your altitude calculation is AMGL here. And then just pull the tops of the clouds down until you get the fog layer that you want. So we'll bring it down here so that we can uh, see, uh, not see through to the airport there, enough that it'll cloud that out. But you can see the cloud uh, bottoms are low enough that it covers the ground, but the tops are low enough that some of the surrounding mountain terrain is actually poking out. And you will see this uh, a lot in mountainous areas uh, where you'll get kind of this morning fog. You see this a lot in videos. Uh, to where you've got kind of a, a, a fog that it doesn't uh, cover everything, but it covers uh, the ground, uh, the lower ground, with the higher terrain uh, coming out of the clouds. So that's how you achieve this effect. You can also play around with the density slider here. You know, if you want kind of a misty sort of effect where you can see uh, everything, uh, but it's got kind of a, a morning mist effect to it. That's how you achieve this effect. Uh, the only caution I'd say here is if you're going to shoot an approach, uh, if you're going to you know, crank it up to, it looks like about three is what we need uh, to not be able to see the ground. Uh, just remember that if you do that, uh, the visibility on the ground is going to be dropped down and you may not be able to have adequate visibility to get in on an approach if you're shooting an approach. So the next thing we'll take a look at is how to control the winds. Uh, the winds are located in the same area as the clouds, but they're located on the right side of the menu versus the left side for the clouds. Uh, this little symbol over here is the wind symbol, and uh, all of the weather presets in Microsoft Flight Simulator start you out with one layer of wind at the surface, 
and you can add wind layers to that if you would like to. And then to actually manipulate the wind layers, you go in here and you click on the wind symbol of the layer that you want to manipulate, and that brings up a submenu here uh, where you can change things about the wind. The first thing that it lists up here is where that wind level is located. So this bottom one down here is located at the ground, and all the wind levels go up to the next wind level if you have another wind level, or if you don't have another wind level, that wind level will go all the way up to the top of the atmosphere and flight simulator. The highest level you can set the wind at is 60,000 feet, and I think that probably goes up to 150,000 feet is the top of the atmosphere and flight simulator, so you would have uh, winds all the way up to that altitude, I believe. Um, if you look at the different wind layers, an example here, uh, this bottom wind layer starts at the ground, so it's at the surface, and it goes up to the next wind layer, and the next wind layer that we have set here is at 6,000 feet. And so that will go from 6,000 feet up to the top of the atmosphere. And then we can control where this wind layer is by clicking on it and holding it and then moving it up and down. Uh, so if we want to set that wind layer at a little lower, we just drag it down to the altitude that we want. If we want to set it a little higher, we also drag it up to the uh, altitude that we want. Unfortunately, there's no way to click on a box and do that numerically. You can't do it very precisely. You have to use the uh, click and move method for that. Another thing that's important to note is that um, you want to be careful with the altitude calculation with this because it is going to set the altitude that the winds are out based on what you have in this altitude correct cal calculation. And again, I prefer to set them at uh, reference to mean sea level. But you do need to be careful if you've got a strong wind layer set at, say, 4,000 feet and then you decide to land at Denver, you're going to have that strong wind layer on the ground at Denver. So that is something to be careful about. As far as I know, there's no limit to the number of wind layers that you can add. Uh, and if you want to get rid of a wind layer, all you have to do is click it, and that'll bring up your submenu, and then just click on Delete Layer at the bottom, and that will get rid of that wind uh, layer. As far as actually controlling the wind layer uh, underneath the elevation of the wind, it will give you a readout of the direction of the wind, uh, the velocity of the wind, and the gusts. Gusts are just uh, temporary increases or decreases in the wind speed. Call them gusts and lulls. Uh, and you can set that up with a submenu that's down below the main wind velocity menu. You control the wind direction. You can either put the wind direction in here numerically in the box, and then it will change the arrow down below. So say if I want the wind out of the south, I can type in 180, then hit enter, and you can see that switches the wind direction around. Or I can also use this arrow here, click on the little uh, knob or the little uh, circle at the bottom there, and I can uh, move the wind direction around from there. Variable will always appear if your gusts, uh, your wind uh, direction and your gust direction is from a different uh, angle. And so if I set these both up here to about 180, uh, and I think it's also if it's below five knots of speed, it will always appear, appear as variable. But you'll see from this windsock here that even if you, if you take out all the gusts and uh, just change the direction on the wind, uh, you will also get, you, you'll get a steady state wind from the direction you want, but it will still stay variable up here. We can also uh, control the wind velocity. We can, again, either enter the number numerically that we want down here, or we can uh, use the slider. Uh, I would caution, if you're going to go up into the upper ranges of the winds, and particularly if you're using a light aircraft, make sure to put yourself into an active pause, uh, because if you the range on the wind slider is between zero or calm wind, all the way up to 150 knots, which is category five strength, I believe, for a hurricane. And uh, if you're not in an active pause, it does have the potential to actually uh, blow your airplane away, uh, and that usually ends badly. So if you're in an active pause, you know that's not going to happen. You'll notice when I move this wind velocity slider up, it right now controls both the uh, base velocity and the gusts. Uh, I can take those gusts out of there. Let's talk about setting up gusts first. So I'll set the wind speed uh, so that it's coming out of the south at 10 knots, and it's also gusting to uh, 11 knots, uh, 11 knots gusting to 11 knots. And I can control the gusts down here if I want to uh, have a gust, have a temporary increase or decre decrease in the, air, in the gust speed, then I can control that here. It does have a limit to how much higher than the base velocity it will go. And then you also have a way to set how frequently the gusts 
occur, and then it shows you uh, what the wind is doing, how often it's gusting up, how often it's lulling down. And it's important to note that the gust is not only how high the wind will gust uh, up to that speed, but it will also gust. It will also lull down by about that same difference between your base wind and your gust velocity. So I've got a difference of about 10 knots or so uh, between my base speed and my gust velocity. Uh, so it's going to gust up to close to 20 knots, uh, then it comes down closer to the mean of about 10 knots, but then it will also lull down about 10 knots uh, from that peak gust. So we're getting a swing in the wind speed of about uh, 20 knots total. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. I can also control how frequently the gusts occur if I only want to, you can set them in the gust per minute. Uh, so if I want, to, want the gust to occur less frequently, uh, I can set that. Uh, setting it to one basically gets rid of your gusts, and then you can set it to where it occurs just a couple of times every minute or up to 18 times a minute, which is you know once every couple of seconds or so. Uh, the other thing you can do with the gust is you can bring the gust velocity down to zero, and that will effectively turn the gusts off if you just want a steady state wind speed. Another thing that's kind of cool about the winds in Flight Simulator is they do have a noticeable environmental effect. Uh, you'll notice that as you increase the winds that uh, things like grass and trees will start to react. You'll start to see them uh, blowing in the breeze and the trees will even uh, blow the right direction. And if you increase the wind speed substantially, uh, you'll see even more movement from those objects. Uh, another thing that the winds control is the sea state in uh, Flight Simulator, or, or really the state of any uh, body of water that's large enough uh, to have a wind effect on it. And you can see here, uh, when we have a calm wind, which is what I have set right now, we have a pretty glassy water out there, a uh, lot of reflection and no ripples. Uh, but if I uh, push the wind speed up uh, just a little bit, a couple knots, you can see the ripples uh, start to form, and they do form correctly uh, for the direction that uh, I have the wind set to come from. You can see they move a different direction when I change the wind direction. And as you continue to increase that, uh, the chop level of chop will continue to increase. When you get up above about uh, 10 knots or so, you'll start to have a little sea foam, a little white cap action start to go on there. And then as you continue to increase the wind speed, the waves will get larger. And you can even push them all the way up to you know, hurricane force and get very large waves uh, with a lot of sea foam. And it's even kind of interesting when you drop the winds down completely, the sea foam will stay there and then it will dissipate over the course of about a minute or so. Uh, so the winds have a very big effect on the sea state. There is a quirk in the wind settings that you should be aware of. When you set a surface wind using the AMSL altitude calculation, it will set the velocity at the surface to roughly half of your selected value. For example, if you set a 20 knot wind, the velocity on the ground will only be 10 knots. This will shear to that set velocity as you climb out, starting to increase at 100 feet AGL and reaching your selected velocity by 1,000 feet above the ground. Conversely, if you use the AMGL altitude calculation to set your wind, the velocity at the surface will be as you set it, but it will shear to a velocity of roughly double your selected value by the time you reach 1,000 feet, again starting at roughly 100 feet AGL. This means if you selected a wind velocity of 20 knots, you'll get a 20 knot wind at the surface that shears to a 40 knot wind by 1,000 feet AGL. This means if you set the wind velocity to the maximum possible velocity of 150 knots, you can generate a 300 knot wind above 1,000 feet, which is fast enough to have most of the airplanes in the game flying backwards if you fly directly into it. Just be careful if you try this. A shear of 150 knots will probably cause the black screen of death for most airplanes in the game if you try to take off or climb through it. I don't think this system is working as intended, so I wouldn't be surprised if a fix is implemented within the next few months. 
Another fun thing you can do in Microsoft Flight Simulator with the wind is to set yourself a uh, very stout headwind uh, to enable yourself to do uh, vertical takeoffs and landings and kind of a hover taxi uh, in an aircraft. And the way you want to do this, make sure that your uh, altitude calculation is set to AMSL, again, because of that uh, wind shear issue we just talked about. And then click on the uh, surface wind. Make sure that you have the velocity going straight down the runway. Uh, runway heading here is we're sitting in Pine Bluff, so about 180 or so. And then uh, you want to go down and eliminate the gusts. So bring the gust speed to zero so you have a nice steady state wind and not a gusty wind. And then what you want to do is you want to bring the wind velocity up until your airspeed indicator indicates about uh, VSO. So again, with that wind shear issue we talked about, this is going to be roughly double whatever your VSO is. So in the Katana, our VSO is 40-ish uh, knots, just below 40 knots. So we're going to bring this up to uh, close to 80 knots to get that in there. Once you've done that, uh, you can just release your parking brake and uh, push the throttle forward just a little bit and your aircraft will get airborne in record, record time. And then you can do kind of slow flight over the runway, do kind of a hover taxi type thing, and you can do the ultimate short field landing. This will work in uh, most aircraft in the game, except perhaps maybe the uh, Volocopter. Uh, it'll even work on the big jets. Uh, one thing that you do need to be cautious about, and this is any time you use large uh, scale velocity winds, is uh, if you make a turn, in a wind with a speed like this, uh, the shear is going to be very strong and it will be strong enough to uh, either cause or stall or damage a lot of aircraft. So be careful with that. You'll notice that I haven't mentioned anything about how to set visibility in Microsoft Flight Simulator, and that's because there's not a way to control that directly. You have to use humidity, precipitation, or clouds to control visibility, as we've talked about earlier in the video. Asobo has promised that that's an improvement that will be coming to the sim, but as far as I'm aware, no timeline has been set for that. And that brings me to my final point, which is that the weather system and controls in Microsoft Flight Simulator appears to still be very much a work in progress. It can do some amazing things, but there's still plenty of features that are a little quirky or rough around the edges. I anticipate the system will improve with time, and I will provide update videos when there are significant changes. In the meantime, hopefully this video has given you some good information on how the system works and what you can do with it in its current build. That concludes this video. As always, if you've enjoyed the content, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.